Hey you, it's me, MK, welcoming you to my little corner in the Shadow Realm. And this Halloween, it's time to get spooky and a little silly. The Hotel Transylvania movies hold a special place in my heart. Every time a new one came out, my dad and I would watch them together. They were our movies. The franchise may not be one of the most beloved, but it has flavor to it, and the movies remain some of the most unique-looking CGI animated films to this day. I mean, look at this! They somehow managed to get a rubber hose style down really well in 3D. And it's thanks to Gendy Tartakovsky, who most people know for his work on Dexter's Laboratory and Samurai Jack. Although we didn't work on this show, I can also see some influence from Foster's Home for Imaginary Friends, especially with how the main cast has their own unique styles of walking around. I still love half of Hotel Transylvania's movies to this day, so I thought it'd be a great idea to look through the quadrology and discuss how we got from here to there, for better or for worse. Also, I will be skipping the short Goodnight Mr. Foot because it's unimportant, and Hotel Transylvania the series because it's a prequel that retcons the original movie in many ways, and although I don't like it, it's also obviously non-canon, so there's no point in giving it the time of day. So, without further ado, let's delve into where it all began. Hotel Transylvania is about Dracula and his daughter Mavis. Shortly after Mavis was born, an angry mob of humans set their house on fire and killed Martha, Dracula's wife. So he fled with Mavis and built Hotel Transylvania, a sanctuary for all kinds of monsters. The whole opening with Dracula taking care of baby Mavis makes me feel all warm and fuzzy inside. On her 118th birthday, Mavis has dreams of seeing the world with a particular interest in Hawaii, which she mistakenly names Hawiwi, but Dracula is worried that Mavis will be hunted down just like her mother. Not helping things is that a human accidentally stumbled upon the hotel and he and Mavis zing. That is to say, they're soulmates. And because Dracula disguised him to not make everybody freak out, he's the only one who knows Johnny Stein is human. Now, I think a lot of people really detest the love at first sight or destined to be together plots and they can absolutely go wrong with bad execution. But the trope itself isn't terrible as long as the romance is still compelling. Mavis and Johnny's romance is viable because they're kind of like attracting opposites and exactly what each other need. Mavis is easily excitable while Johnny is more flexibly mellow, and while Johnny helps Mavis get the courage to step out of Dracula's comfort zone, Mavis offers a place where Johnny can have some stability and actually call it home, as we'll see in the next installment. They complement each other, and it's the little moments that say a lot. The scene where they watch the sunrise is probably my favorite scene the two have in the entire franchise. Johnny's supposed to leave the hotel on Dracula's orders, but he stays because of Mavis and follows her to the roof. He then gets Mavis into the shade so she won't burn alive, but it's a safe enough distance to watch the rising sun for the first time in her life. This is the most incredible thing I've ever seen. But enough about Mavis and Johnny. What about Dracula? He too could have been really easy to botch. When Mavis goes off to explore a nearby village with Dracula's permission, it's actually a fake one and he stages a mob attack with his zombie employees masquerading as humans. This is so he'll scare her away from wanting to see the human world. What he did was wrong, but you can understand why he did it even though the movie makes it clear it's no excuse. Martha's death still traumatizes him after all those years and it sets him up for a compelling arc. It takes Johnny for him to realize not all humans are terrible and the world has changed since a century ago. Johnny is likely the only human he's met who's not antagonistic towards monsters, so around halfway through the movie, Dracula softens up and after having a heart-to-heart -heart about Martha's death, Drac even tells Johnny he shouldn't leave until Mavis's birthday is over since he's done a lot to boost morale around the hotel. Making it better is Dracula saying Johnny would make a great vampire. That's really sweet. Dracula also has to learn to be flexible with Mavis. He puts a lot of emphasis on her safety, but he leaves little room for her happiness, which is just as important. After Dracula snaps at Mavis for kissing Johnny, he confesses the village was a setup and Johnny is outed as a human. As everyone panics, Mavis still accepts Johnny. I don't care. I still want to be with you. <laughs> Remember this, it will be a very important topic of discussion when we reach the end of the franchise. Unfortunately, 
Johnny dumps her out of respect for Dracula, who quickly realizes it was a major mistake after Mavis reveals she and Johnny zinged, so he risks burning alive in the sun to bring him back. Not only does it result in a funny convention scene that proves to Dracula that humans love monsters now, but the speech he makes for Johnny on the plane is such a great moment. My dear boy, I have made a terrible mistake. The truth is, you and Mavis are meant to be. You zinged! If she must give her trust to someone else, I'm thankful that it is you, Jonathan. All of this makes for a really good story, and I haven't even mentioned the other side characters or the humor. Yeah, for a rather dark story, it's balanced out well with rubber hosey slapstick, banter... Are these monsters gonna kill me? Not as long as they think you're a monster. Huh? That's kinda racist. And gags that range from juvenile to genius. One standout for me is when the werewolf whistles to summon his children, but you can't hear anything. Also when he swallows all those sheep whole like a vacuum cleaner on steroids. And I still get a chuckle when Quasimodo's frozen and someone comes over to stick his finger in his nose. As for one-liners, they typically come from Dracula, Johnny, or the Drac Pack, Dracula's closest friends. They consist of Frankenstein's monster, who's a pretty cool dude aside from his fear of fire, Murray, a mummy with swagger, Wayne, a werewolf who can't stop getting his wife pregnant, and Griffin, the invisible man who wears nothing but a pair of glasses and has the single funniest moment in this movie. Uh, what's wrong with red curly hair? Why are you getting upset? I have red curly hair! An honorable mention goes to Eunice Frankenstein, who is wonderfully voiced by Fran Drescher and horribly underused throughout the franchise. The other Drac Pack wife, the permanently pregnant Wanda Werewolf, gets a chance to shine in the third movie, but it takes the last one for Eunice to get a fair share of spotlight. Overall, Hotel Transylvania is a really nice movie. The aesthetic's charming, it has a good sense of humor and heart behind its story, and it's all around a feel-good movie where I can't help but smile nearly the whole way through. It's a well-done father-daughter movie too, which explains why the franchise has become my dad and I's special movies. A solid 8 out of 10. Moving on to the next installment, Hotel Transylvania 2 opens with Mavis and Johnny's wedding. Mavis's wish to travel the world has been granted, and a year after the wedding, Dracula finds out that Aha, Jonathan, you are banging my daughter! And he's gonna be a grandpa. Dennis, who Dracula affectionately nicknames Denisovich as per vampire naming traditions, is born. But tensions quickly rise between Dracula and Mavis. Dracula is looking forward to Dennis eventually growing in his vampire fangs a little too much, but Mavis insists that Dennis is a human baby. For a lot of Hotel Transylvania 2, Mavis gets on Dracula's case for his overenthusiastic attitude towards Dennis unlocking his vampire powers because she fears he won't accept having a human grandson. But Mavis shows hints of leaning into human culture too much herself, showing what could be the opposite extreme. Twinkle, twinkle, little star. How I want Mommy, you I'm too old are. for lullabies. What? That's not how that one goes. This is the way most people sing it. Most people? What's wrong with suffer, suffer, scream in pain, blood is spilling from your brain? She eventually breaks the news to Dracula that she plans on moving away because the hotel is dangerous for what she believes is an almost five year old human boy, while Dracula insists he's a late finger like himself. However, because the hotel makes him feel he can truly be himself compared to his family, Johnny doesn't want to go, and neither does the unaware Dennis. So he and Dracula work together to either make California undesirable for Mavis, or get Dennis to grow in his fangs. I think it's the common consensus that Hotel Transylvania 2 is the best movie of the franchise, and I can see why. The comedy is snappier this time around, leaning further into the joke-per-minute style. Since the story is not as heavy as the first Hotel Transylvania, it has to rely on its humor to keep the audience sucked in, and it works. The Drac Pack is still funny as ever, if not funnier than before. Here. We. Go! Whee! He's still not flying. He will. But on the weirder side of things, Mavis and Johnny have switched personalities. 
Now, it's mostly Mavis who's the mature one, while Johnny is the easily excitable one. You feel me now? That's my girlfriend, suckers! Your wife, Johnny. My wife, even better! This is explained by Johnny's reason for not wanting to move away, so him getting a little goofier can easily be seen as him letting looser and both of them rubbing off each other. It's not a bad change, since Mavis still has that excitable side as seen when she visits California for the first time, and Johnny still genuinely feels like Johnny since, for the most part, they still make him wiser than Mavis here and in the third installment. Now, I bet you're wondering, why doesn't he confront Mavis directly? Well, she's too much like her dad. When she's stubborn, she's not the easiest to talk to. Her decision prioritizes Dennis's safety above all else. So she doesn't take into consideration that neither Johnny nor Dennis will be happy in California, blindly believing they'll eventually come around. Even though she witnesses Dennis being bullied by his own cousins, and she's also asking a kid almost five years old to basically leave all his friends and everything he's ever known behind. That could traumatize the poor boy. And earlier in the movie, Dracula tells Mavis that he didn't invite Vlad to her wedding because he's dangerous and would eat Johnny due to his stronger hatred of humankind. But Mavis believes he can or has changed for the better. So six years later, she invites him to Dennis's birthday party behind Dracula's back, which results in almost deadly consequences, but I'll delve deeper in a bit. Johnny can't communicate with someone who won't listen. So that's why he tries to point out the negatives of moving to California in perhaps a subtle way of saying, I don't think we should move here. Mavis and Johnny end up coming back from their trip early when she sees a video of Dracula throwing Dennis off a cliff in another attempt to get his bat form out of him. She takes this as a refusal to accept humans into his heart and she decides she's taking Johnny and Dennis away without allowing them to add their input. This is where the movie loses me. Everything up to here was fine, but as soon as Mavis and Johnny return to Transylvania, it takes a pretty huge nosedive. The narrative takes Mavis's side, even though she completely misreads the situation. We'll have his birthday party here on Wednesday. Then we're moving. Hold wait, first of all, you're not gonna speed past that like you didn't just say what you just said. We're not talking about- Maybe you've let humans into your hotel, Dad. But I don't think you've let them into your heart. We're talking about- You want to stay here, right? Of course! She later catches Dennis trying to become a bat on his own and still doesn't realize it's because no one wants the California move to happen. Dennis figures out why Mavis wants them to move, but she has the audacity to lie when it would have hurt less for Dennis if she just admitted he was right. Yeah, he would have been crushed, but at least his trust in his own mother wouldn't have been broken. And the least she could have done for Dennis's sake was agree to move somewhere not too far away. That way he wouldn't have to worry about never seeing his friends again. But she's letting her anger against Dracula get the best of her and it turns from misguided to selfish. But the real reason she's acting this way is because she's insecure about her own monsterhood. Maybe if Dennis grows up away from Transylvania, he won't be so freaky. Like... Me. Dracula's already made it clear that he loves Dennis no matter what, even though he is very overexcited at the prospect of him becoming a vampire. So really, this is just Mavis making Drac out to be the bad guy by projecting herself onto him and hurting Johnny and Dennis just so she doesn't have to face her own problems. It's downright hypocritical since the first movie painted Dracula as in the wrong for leaving little room for Mavis's happiness amidst her safety, but sides with Mavis when she threatens to do the same thing to Dennis. At least Dracula wasn't stupid enough to risk getting his family killed, which Mavis does by inviting Vlad. Her blind optimism has made her an idiot. The party goes south when Vlad schemes with Dracula to bring out Dennis's fangs by corrupting his favorite TV character, much to Johnny's discomfort, and soon after Dracula puts Dennis first and stops Vlad, Vlad finds out Johnny and his parents are in fact not monsters but humans, and his henchmen are on the prowl. Dennis runs away with his best friend, Winnie the Werepup, when Dracula and Mavis argue over him, and both are captured by Bella, Vlad's second in command. You know, for someone hyped up to be even worse of a human hater than Dracula, Vlad is rather tame. The worst he gets to do is yell, Why don't you just put a stake through my heart? You're, You're a, a fool! fool! Before being put down right away and Mavis tearfully admitting she shouldn't have invited him. I don't know why I ever invited you. 
you stupid bitch. I'd also like to point out that Johnny finally stands up for Dennis and confronts Mavis about her choice, but he doesn't have time to properly call her out before the conversation switches to telling off Vlad for not accepting the human family Mavis married into, and Dennis goes missing. So she doesn't get to have a Dracula moment like in the first Hotel Transylvania, and her hypocrisy is swept under the rug. But hey, at least it's not as bad as certain other examples I've covered. Still, the fact that Mavis's whole arc falls apart as soon as she and Johnny get back to Transylvania is a sign that the writers don't really know what to do with Mavis after the first movie. She was just as much of a main character as Dracula there, yet the creators favor Dracula and generally know exactly which center stage stories to tell with him, while Mavis slowly gets shoved to the side more and more until she's practically a useless side character. Anyway, Dennis unlocks his vampire side when the cronies hurt Winnie, everyone except Johnny due to getting lost on the way fights back, and suddenly Vlad is a good guy and Mavis allows her family to stay at Hotel Transylvania now that Dennis's half-heritage has been reconciled. It's a total mess of a third act, turning Mavis into an insufferable dumbass and Vlad into a disappointment of an antagonist. Vlad's redemption could have worked if he was developed better, and I really wish Johnny would have been present at the final fight. The alternate version of the climax is so much better and actually gives Vlad a fleshed out redemption arc, almost fixing how wimpy he is when the party goes wrong. And I have absolutely no problem with Dennis getting vampire powers. I feel most people who complain about it have fallen victim to the narrative trying to say Dracula doesn't accept humans, Mavis is completely right, when in reality Drac was just too excited and Mavis had no self-awareness about how she became just like her father. A healthy little vampire. Or human. Yes, a human who can fly as a bat. Johnny! Dennis is not a monster! You're just like your father! Despite wanting what was best for her family, she wouldn't listen in times that mattered most, discouraging discussion when her husband and son were unhappy with what she wanted for them and ignoring how awful Johnny's family is. Oh yeah, as if the cousins weren't bad enough, Mike and Linda are kinda sorta casually racist towards monsters. Maybe he'd be better off where we live. There's more humans there. I've set up your bedroom. Mike was afraid he'd get disemboweled and eaten, but I told him he was just being silly. That was you, Linda. Oh, that's lovely. Sort of like a last hurrah before Dennis gets to be with normal people. I think I'm starting to like being creepy. <laughs> My main problems with Dennis getting fangs are that in the next two movies, nothing is done with Dennis using his vampire powers, and because of the way Mavis is handled here, it kind of makes it seem like Dennis earned his ability to stay which alongside Vlad's rushed redemption takes a lot of the blame off Mavis and allows her to avoid learning her lesson or taking accountability for her mistakes. She doesn't have to apologize for risking her family's lives because she was right about Vlad all along, and she doesn't have to apologize for not giving Johnny and Dennis a chance to have a say and be listened to because it was Dennis's responsibility to prove his right to stay, even though he's five years old. In turn, she learns absolutely nothing, and that's just tragic. If Hotel Transylvania 2 got another rewrite to fix these issues, it could have been fine the whole way through. But the third act really brings the entire movie down. This installment gets a 6 out of 10. Before we move on to Hotel Transylvania 3, it's time for Puppy! A short that was bundled with the Emoji movie. You don't really need to watch this, just be aware it exists because the puppy from it is present in 3. But when you actually watch it, it's got a couple of good laughs. Roll over, sit, speak! Hi, how are you? It's also one of the two other times we see Dennis use his vampire powers. 6 out of 10. Okay folks, we're kicking back into high gear with Hotel Transylvania 3. We open with new lore, showing Dracula's various pursuits with a young Abraham Van Helsing, who many know as the vampire hunter in the classic Dracula story. He's hellbent on destroying not only Dracula, but all monsters, yet he's outsmarted every time by Dracula himself. We cut back to the present of Far, Far Away, where Dracula and Mavis help a monster bride calm down from her wedding jitters. Honestly, wedding openings earned their place as a staple for Hotel Transylvania sequels. They're knocking it out of the park. Dracula now has a new problem to deal with. He's very lonely and wants to get back into the dating game. Frank sets him up with another Frankenstein monster, but it doesn't go well. Dracula also tries Zinger, a monster version of Tinder, but still has no luck. 
There's also Mavis to worry about, since he won't confide in her about his desire for another romantic partner. But this time it's valid, because obviously telling your kids, Hey, I was thinking of getting you a new stepmother, would 9 times out of 10 not go well once they're old enough to comprehend the idea. Mavis believes Dracula is only stressed about overworking himself, so after stumbling upon an advertisement for Legacy Cruises, the entire hotel goes on a special monster cruise to the Bermuda Triangle and Atlantis. Unbeknownst to them, it's ran by Van Helsing and his great-granddaughter Erica, who Dracula zings with and spends the rest of the movie trying to figure things out for himself. So first, I want to address the elephant in the room. A zing has previously stated to only happen once in someone's lifetime. That's why it's so sacred. But when they retcon this, it's one of the few examples where the retcon is done right. After Drac zings with Erica, it's not brushed off like it's no big deal. He and the Drac pack acknowledge that zinging twice was thought by everybody to be impossible. Some fans theorize that Erica is a reincarnation of Martha, while others just think it's a take on you can fall in love with and have multiple loves of your lives. But whatever the reason could be, I think they handle it well. It all relies on Erica herself and her chemistry with Dracula, which really is there. I love Erica. She manages to be both charming and unhinged, making her fit in well with the Hotel Transylvania crew. Debbie Jelinski walked so this woman could run. Even though Van Helsing raised Erica to hate monsters and her flirting with Drac is just a little something to butter him up before she and Van Helsing kill him in a few days, her arc in learning to break free from Van Helsing's legacy and live her own life is natural. What ultimately endears her to Drac and monster kind as a whole is watching Dracula, Mavis, Johnny, and Dennis having fun as a family. As we learn on Dracula and Erica's first date, Erica's parents died when she was a baby. Van Helsing is very emotionally neglectful and only shows care for Erica if she devotes herself to carrying out their family's monster hunting legacy, later going as far as to try to kill her without any hesitation or remorse when she refuses to carry it out. So watching and learning more about Dracula's family is Erica's first realization that Van Helsing may have been wrong about monster kind. Then he saves her life when he catches her sneaking onto restricted property, and let me tell you, if that tango of death can't convince you they've got chemistry, then I don't know what can. Sure, Erica's not quite there yet, and rejects Drac when Mavis forces him to tell the truth about him and Erica, but she ultimately comes around once Dracula's life is at stake, which is doubly sweet when you realize she probably also saved him to spare Mavis the pain of losing both her parents like she did. Speaking of, Mavis's riding here is a step up from Hotel Transylvania 2. Her arc is fully realized, and although she's suspicious of Erica, she doesn't actively try to keep her away from Dracula until she thinks she's trying to kill him. Which, let's be honest, she had good reason to think so when Johnny told her about the garlic guacamole. Woohoo! Heads up, honey! This guac is loaded with garlic. Garlic? <gasps> Aw, that was a cute tune, honey. The only problem I have with Mavis is why she doesn't want Dracula to have another lover. It's just the thought of losing you. What? What are you talking about, losing me? Well, obviously, after you get married, you're gonna live on a ship and travel around the world. Oh, so it's only okay when you want to leave? Man, what a hypocrite! At least it's just one little thing that doesn't completely unravel her or the movie. Johnny's also down really well, still hitting that good balance between his chill, wise side and his more fun-loving one. He sees right through Dracula and Erica and supports them from afar. Don't you think he's acting weird lately? Not really. Besides having a huge crush on the captain. What? But he doesn't neglect Mavis's say and helps her sort out her feelings. He sympathizes with her discomfort, but also gently reminds her that Dracula deserves happiness too. I'm telling you, Johnny, there is something about that woman I don't trust. But you want your dad to be happy, right? Yes. And during the final battle against Van Helsing's mind-controlled Kraken, Johnny plays a pivotal role in saving the day, using his DJ skills to combat the song Van Helsing uses to keep the Kraken under his control with more positive tunes. He's got good picks, using Good Vibrations by the Beach Boys and Don't Worry Be Happy by Bobby McFerrin, but what ultimately overpowers the Kraken is the Macarena. Dot is a nut, so they call her Macadamia. She's cracked in the head and cookie in the brainia. Each line in the song sounds pretty much the same. Oi, Macadamia! Duh. 
It's a funny note to end on, though it's darkly hilarious when you realize the world's most positive song, according to Johnny, is one about a girl who cheats on her boyfriend with two guys while he's away at war. Dude, this is pretty f***ed up right here. As I mentioned previously, Wayne and Wanda get more spotlight. They drop their kids off at the Legacy's daycare center and we see them at their happiest. They play fetch together at the beach and run around the ship's deck like little puppies. Eunice also gets a couple moments to shine, like getting her hair messed up in the monster volleyball game and having a sweet moment when Frank rubs lotion on her back when they're at the beach. The only ones that don't get much to do are Dennis and Winnie, who appear for a couple scenes and try to keep Tinkles out of trouble since they snuck him onto a cruise ship that doesn't allow pets. Dennis? Who is this? Uh, it's our friend Bob. Say hi, Bob. Hi, Bob. The same applies to Crystal. She's the invisible woman who meets Griffin during Hotel Transylvania 2's dance party ending and is his girlfriend from then on. It's easy to forget she's in this movie or ever appears again after 2. I'm also kind of shocked that Vlad doesn't get to do much when the cruise is meant to be a family vacation, but it's probably to be expected considering how he was handled in 2. Another notable thing to point out is that the humor is slower compared to the first two. There wasn't that much that made me laugh aside from the Macarena battle, Dracula slipping into gibberish Transylvanian. Oh, you're speaking Transylvanian. Oh, always wanted to learn. Uh, a dooby day shoe la coopy day. A coopy day. Coopy day. A coopy day. Coopy day. Your delicious neck wrappings are in the nice coffin. Would you like to see my part? And the high bob scene. The scuba walk could have worked, but because it's rooted too much in Johnny's regular walking style, it would have worked better if it had Johnny walking past Mavis, Dennis, and Dracula putting on their scuba gear, the three of them looking excitedly at him, then cutting to them walking like that together as a sweet moment of copying the way he moves. The good news is that although the comedy takes a break here, the story makes up for it and serves as a reminder that, yes, although this franchise is primarily known for being funny, it can still tell a good story half of the time. All in all, Hotel Transylvania 3 is still a good time the whole way through and definitely the second best film of the franchise. 7 out of 10. No, we're not at the end yet. We have another short. Monster Pets, the first canon entry to have Brian Hole replace Adam Sandler as Dracula. Replacing voices isn't new. CeeLo Green as Murray got replaced with Keegan-Michael Key from 2 onwards, and after Monster Pets, we lose Kevin James as Frank. But back to the subject at hand. Dracula tries to find other pets for Tinkles to play with since running a hotel and taking care of a massive dog would wear anybody out. Eventually, the one cat amidst the dogs proves to be a good playmate for Tinkles, but both of them still want to play with Dracula. The comedy's vastly improved over Puppy, especially the bits with dropping the large red rubber ball on Drac various times and the Franken-dog just vibing with his detachable body parts. 8 out of 10. And now we finally reach the fourth and last movie in the franchise, Hotel Transylvania Transformania. When you narrow it down to the simplest of story beats, Johnny wants to be a monster and Dracula accidentally becomes human. Let me tell you, it had potential to be the best movie in the entire franchise. It's an opportunity to explore what it means for Mavis and Dracula to have zinged with mortals and how Johnny and Erica deal with inevitably getting left behind as they won't live past 90 while the two vampires get who knows how many zings for all eternity. Basically, it could call back to the first Hotel Transylvania's roots and dabbling into serious topics amidst the comedy. But no, that's not what we got. Instead, we have a story about Johnny thinking Dracula, who literally risked burning alive in the sun just to get him back to his zing, doesn't see him as part of his family. But Johnny still becomes a monster for Mavis. Not from the fear of being outlived, but because Dracula lied about a monster real estate law to stop Johnny from turning the hotel into an 80s neon nightmare and in turn screwing over Mavis. Something's wrong with you. Really. Johnny gets flanderized big time here. He's downright unrecognizable because he's an annoying hyperactive airhead who doesn't show off any signs of being wise deep down until the campfire scene, which is at the tail end of the second act. Dracula is also quite insufferable. 
He's gotten stressed before and briefly took it out on others, but he focuses on using Johnny as his emotional punching bag, constantly stating throughout the movie that he ruins everything. Oh, you know Johnny. He just gets a little carried away. Yes, exactly. And ruins everything. I thought I could give the hotel to Mavis and Johnny, but he's going to ruin everything. I can't trust you to do anything right. This is so out of character, and you can tell this is a cheap attempt to stretch that one character trait as far as they can in an attempt to convince the audience that Dracula hates Johnny. And Johnny's right to think Dracula doesn't accept him as part of his family. Look back on the other three movies, and that's never been the case. It only makes things worse when you realize the journey to get the pair back to normal consists of solely the pair traveling through the jungle together and spending a majority of the movie away from everybody else. Great. Speaking of everybody else, they did Mavis dirty again. After the anniversary party happens where Dracula should have announced his retirement but doesn't just to screw over Johnny, Mavis spends a whole half hour doing nothing but look for Johnny and Dracula in the hotel. Erica does the same thing, but she gets more to do beforehand overall, and her relationship with Drac isn't shoved to the side, so she's done less dirty. Except she and Johnny don't interact at all when they absolutely should've. They would've been my favorite animated in-laws if they talked to each other just once in this entire franchise. All they get is Erica briefly reminding Dracula that handing the hotel to Mavis means also handing it over to Johnny. Everything has to be perfect when I finally give the hotel to Mavis. <gasps> what? And Johnny. Yes, and Johnny. And I guess what Mavis got is better than Dennis, Winnie, and Van Helsing getting only five minutes of screen time and Vlad being completely gone. But that doesn't make her role in the story good. Let's take a break from the negatives and talk about a couple of positives because, surprise, surprise, there are some. For one, the montage of Mavis growing up with Dracula as he sings a cover of Just the Two of Us is really sweet. Johnny's moment of wisdom about the burnt marshmallow is nice. If you only see the worst in things, you'll miss the best part. Here, look, 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 look. At first, a tasty marshmallow. Then... <gasps> Oh no, it's on fire and ruin! But, blow out the fire, and crack open the burnt stuff, you'll find something sweet and gooey inside. You just have to look for it. Johnny's dragon form looks pretty good. The Drakpex human forms are pretty accurate to what one would imagine, with Griffin proving once and for all that he does have curly red hair. Everybody was up in arms about how he wasn't drop-dead gorgeous, but the curly red hair being canon should have been the main takeaway, and they got angry for nothing since we did get a handsome humanized monster in Frank. Hello, Mr. Fanservice! Hot damn! Anyway, this is also the most spotlight Eunice has ever gotten in a Hotel Transylvania movie, so I'm definitely on board with that. Van Helsing and Erica's relationship being rocky after what happened in the previous movie is good. I wouldn't expect them to be back on chummy terms after he showed no remorse when he thought he killed her. The comedy's still pretty good, too. I had a few laughs before realizing what movie I was watching, and certainly before... IT happened. So basically, Van Helsing's monster ray is not a typical monster ray. Not only does it change the body, but it also slowly corrupts the mind until the person turned monster becomes a mindless killing kaiju. Which is what happens to Johnny when Dracula reveals he lied to stop him and Mavis from inheriting the hotel. What? Look, maybe I haven't said it a lot here, but I've said it many other times in many other places by the time the first Hotel Transformania trailer came out. The best outcome this movie could have had is Johnny and Erica turning into monsters so they don't have to worry about being outlived by the loves of their lives. And with Dracula and Mavis having the potential to get countless zings in their eternal lives, that renders the true love aspect worthless. If you've looked at my Tumblr, you know I think Transformania should have ended with Johnny and Erica becoming a slime monster and a gorgon, respectively. Slime matches someone who's flexible and teeters between relaxed and hyperactive, while Gorgon is the closest monster type to Vampire without actually being a vampire because, although Vampire Erica is a neat idea, my love of mixed monster couples is too strong. Now, some of you are probably thinking, 
But MK, if Johnny and Erica turn into monsters, it means they aren't accepted as themselves and the message of the first three movies is pointless. And to that I say... Objection! It instead expands on the message of acceptance because the what doesn't change the who. If Johnny and Erica choose to become monsters to spend all eternity with Mavis and Dracula, they will still be the same people the vampire zinged with, just with a different look and a much longer lifespan. All this, yet Transformania counters it by showing why they can never be monsters. Why do I even bother? Ironically, this turn of events is what ruins the acceptance message. Remember when Mavis and Johnny zinged? He was in his Frankenstein monster disguise. Then when he's outed as a human, Mavis says, I don't care. I still want to be with you. Here, Mavis keeps insisting you're perfect the way you are as reassurance. But when you take into account their drastically different lifespans, Mavis is outright saying she doesn't want Johnny to ever be a different species. It reeks of double standards and is disheartening that Mavis would rather spend the rest of her life getting countless zings instead of living it out with her true love Johnny by her side the whole time. It pretends to be a happy ending, but when you really think about it, it isn't. It's horrifying and leaves a bitter taste. Hotel Transformania had potential to be the best movie in the franchise, but it's fundamentally broken and the delay wasn't enough to fix it, leading to the worst installment and a terrible way to end the Hotel Transylvania story. 3 out of 10. It's so sad Hotel Transylvania had to end this way. I had a fun time with the first, the third, and 60% of the second, and they were this close to going out with a bang, only to mess it all up in Transformania. I don't know if it factors into anything, but Gendy didn't direct the last movie like he usually did. He only wrote the story, so maybe that explains it. It also disappoints me that this franchise fell into the trap of having a pretty good first movie, but making quite the missteps the moment it turns into a multi-movie kind of deal. Call me naive for having hope that it would end well, but I prefer to say wishful thinking because not all of them are bound to end up so badly. Take a look at DreamWorks for heaven's sake. Despite the way Hotel Transylvania ended, I guess I'm happy it got things right half of the time. It's easier for me to enjoy compared to other disastrous ends, since it's harder to believe looking back that everybody would get so bad compared to, per se, Ralph Breaks the Internet. As despite despising Vanellope's characterization, it's unfortunately believable that she'd feed into and embrace the horrible parts of herself. At this point, it's a miracle that Hotel Transylvania has a couple of flicks that continue to provide the gooey goodness within a burnt marshmallow. And for me, that's enough. Well, that's all for now. What did you think of the Hotel Transylvania movies? Like, comment, subscribe, and next time you want to visit the Shadow Realm, I'll be right here. This is MK, signing off.